Greetings and salutations. I find myself in a bit of a quandary, boys and girls, and I'm reaching out to those of you who may be more advanced users of the Linux operating system. I'd like to know your opinion about this. Give you a little background. I posted a video not too long ago where I was talking about upgrading old junk laptops and things like that with new cheap SSDs. Well, I've actually done that to about two or three systems so far in the last month. And in that process, it's really best if you reinstall the Linux operating system because if you would try and clone it with like Clonezilla or something like that, you're going to end up with maybe some not so ideal results because the system really needs to know that it's installing to an SSD. First of all, it aligns the file system it creates to the native cluster size of the drive to make sure that there's not multiple writes across clusters and it also turns on some features that are good for SSDs and help to minimize write cycles and all that goody goody stuff right FS trim and whatnot so uh, I have done that with a bunch of machines and I had a viewer who was asking me uh, some questions about FS tab and the boot process in Linux. And it got me curious because I hadn't really looked at the FS tab files in the machines that I have been doing this with reinstalling. These would be auto generated after uh, the installation process. And for those of you who do not know, FS tab is short for file system table. It is a deep Linux configuration file that tells the system where to find storage, where your uh, root directory is, where your home directory is, and you can also branch that out and you can put different pieces of the system in different places and you can add storage and you can do all that stuff. It's uh, FS tab is short for file system table. And I must warn you, if you ever go playing around with this, do so with extreme caution Make sure that you back everything up and you are willing to deal with it if the machine decides not to boot because it's a very sensitive file and the format of the file must be followed exactly. And at some point I think I'm going to do a video that just describes FS tab because I had questions about it not too long ago from a viewer. Uh, let me know if that's something you would like to see. So let's take a look at the FS tab file on this machine, boys and girls. And you'll notice right off the bat that we have two partitions on this hard drive. The first one is going to be your root partition, and that's where your Linux system lives. And the second one is a home partition. I like to do separate root and home partitions. It's not required. You can have everything in one big happy partition if you want to. And, uh, you know, But I like to have them separated so that I can maybe if reinstall the operating system without messing around with my data and that way when I boot it right back up boom I'm right where I was and I don't have to restore my data and stuff like that so there's a lot of good reasons to do this and this machine is so old that it does not have UEFI so therefore there's no EFI boot partition uh, available uh, or needed and then there's also the fact that this is an MS-DOS partition table that we set up here it's not uh, the new GPT what did I do wrong? Have you figured it out yet? It's right there. The root file system where Linux lives and boots from is formatted to ext3 while the home partition is formatted to ext4. ext3 is an older Linux file system that is still available at install or if you use a tool such as gparted to set up your drives and ext3 for me has been a system that I have not had anything to do with for about 10 years simply because when ext4 came along I just said hey great look at all these new features boom and started using it ext3 it used to be the default file system for a lot of Linux distributions and ext4 continues to be the default file system for a lot of Linux distributions these days and it's the go-to for me I know there's other choices out there like uh, we have the XFS system which some people really like to use for servers uh, XFS I've had mixed re mixed results on laptops and desktops not something that I go to XFS has its limitations 
Uh, first of all, XFS, it, it, for me, uh, sucks up a lot of CPU on older machines because it's multi-threaded, which is nice. I mean, you can I'd be accessing several files at the same time, which does speed up performance on a server, but for a desktop or a laptop, who knows? And the other thing about it is, is that um, EXT4 uses a full journal where when it's trying to write things, it keeps a record of what it's doing, whereas uh, XFS, that file system uses a metadata journal. In other words, it doesn't actually worry about data. It only worries about descriptions of where the data is. <laughs> and sometimes that can cause issues if you have a hard crash. You can debate me on that in the comments section. You can go right ahead. And of course, there's also more advanced file systems that are coming along for Linux like uh, BetterFS or ButterFS, whatever you want to call that, BTRFS is uh, one and the other one is ZFS ZFS and I always called it ButterFS they are advanced file systems that have a lot of options and features and go way beyond what anybody with a regular standard desktop or laptop computer could possibly ever need but it's very groovy if you're dealing with servers my go-to is EXT4 and has been for a very long time and I've had good luck with it so here's my quandary, boys and girls. Do I stick with EXT3 or do I convert that to EXT4? Let's talk a little bit about the differences between the different EXT file systems. And we're only going to touch on this very briefly. I do have a video up that I created a while back that uh, really gave me a headache because <laughs> this is very complicated, deep stuff and... Uh, I was really working right at the edge of my understanding and uh, some of this is above my pay grade even now. But if you want to, you can go look at that video. I'll put a link to it in the description here. Uh, you can go check that out for what it's worth. Uh, it's a rather long video as I recall. Anyway, um, brief history. The EXT file system is the original native Linux file system and it was originally introduced very early on in 1992. EXT1 is not around anymore or just simply known as EXT because it had issues that needed to be addressed. It wasn't a matter of updating it. They kind of threw it out and started over. And the uh, stable version they came up with was EXT2. EXT2 is a very simple file system, but at the time it was extraordinarily powerful. I mean, think about the storage requirements for 1993 and then look at the fact that a file could be 16 to 2 terabytes big. That's just a single file. In those days, in 93, oh man, hard drives were tiny. I mean, we're talking like it was very typical to see hard drives with 80 to maybe 200 megabytes at the time. A 500 megabyte drive was just huge in 93. Um, I remember going to work for a radio station and they had a 750 megabyte drive that they were using in one of their machines and it was extraordinarily expensive at that point in time so uh, those kind of uh, yeah, th that's just huge and you could have a file system of 4 terabytes to 32 terabytes depending on how you set it up default inode size 128 bytes that's for EXT2 and EXT3 and then it gets up to 256 with EXT4. And what is an inode? Well, it is a little, it's something that is stored in what is called an inode table. And it is the entry for a file or directory on a Linux based system or Unix as well. You can look at your inodes if you want to you can look at the numbers that go along with them. So on this machine, if I do ls, you'll see that we have the typical stuff that you see in a directory. And if I do ls and then give it the uh, a option, it'll show me all the files. This is all the configuration files. So we have a mix here between files and directories. Now, if I do this and I give it the option i, I was going to give it the long option, but we'll keep it short. Look at what we get now. 
we get a number in front of each one of those files. What does that mean? Well, that's your inode number. And the inode number for a file is the most direct way to find it. So if, for instance, you had a file that was so screwed up that trying to find it by file name, you couldn't look up the inode, but you had its number, you can actually delete the inode without having to go in and get in any of the information. If it's corrupted anyway, right, it's not going to do you any good. But this way is how you can find things that are completely screwed up. Now we're talking about deep system stuff here, but it's very cool, isn't it? Uh, so there's your inodes, and that's what they do. So when they came along with ext4, they made them a little bit bigger. And in that way, uh, sometimes if you have a file that has like two characters in it, like something really short, like a host name file, um, then uh, the system will actually store the information in the inode itself. It won't even go out and ask for data from the data pool on the drive. Very cool indeed. So we got some other things here that uh, we might want to talk about the differences between the system. Multiple block allocation. What does that mean? Well, it means that if the system calls for a chunk of space, the file system can figure out what blocks to use uh, in multiple chunks instead of doing it just one at a time, which would cause a lot of fragmentation, right? And of course, in ext4, we get an advanced uh, thing there. Uh, what else we've got? Uh, directory indexing. ext4, unlike ext2 and ext3, actually tries to keep a little cache of the directories, I guess, that are most often scanned through, and that way it makes it quicker to find things on the system, uh, should you be looking for something. And then we also have uh, pre-allocation, which means that if the system calls, let's say, for two gigabytes of space, that uh, the system would be able to go and figure out where two gigabytes of contiguous space would be on the drive, and then give it to the system uh, to use. Now, um, when they talk about uh, delayed allocation, what that is is that now the system asks for some space on the drive to write to, and the file system has the option of saying, wait, put that in memory, hold on just a second, let me wait until I'm done with this, and then I can do a better job. There you go. That can cause you a bit of heartburn especially if the system crashes because then what happens is is that you uh, you might lose what's in memory but this is why we have journaling file systems so the big difference between ext and ext let's see ext 1 2 and 3 is the fact that when we go to ext 3 we have a journal and the journal it's just a record of what it's doing so in case there's a crash it can go back and read the journal figure out what was going on and then fix the problems. EXT2 has no journal and so with an EXT2 system if you ever try and boot from one and I've done it just for fun and you reboot the system you'll see that uh, let's say you uh, shut the system down hard so it doesn't actually get everything written the way it's supposed to be when you reboot the system you'll see it really going crazy trying to repair things because it doesn't have that journal to go read and go oh that's what we were doing okay let's go fix that but not having a journal means that it performs faster. See, there's trade-offs for everything, boys and girls. And it's the same thing with EXT3. EXT3 does have a journal, but it doesn't have the overhead of some of the features in EXT4. So that begs the question, what is best for a small little laptop computer that you're not expecting to create large files and you're, you're kind of looking at it as just basically a place to put the system. Is it better to leave it at ext3 or should I try and convert it to ext4? That's what I'd like to know. Now I did find this wonderful article here on Linux config. Uh, don't know anything about the site but I just pulled it up doing a web search. And here is some pretty straightforward instructions on how to convert ext3 to ext4 in Linux. See, that's one of the things about the ext file system. They're cross-compatible. They can be mounted as each other sometimes, depending on the system. And you can also go up and down. You can turn features off in ext4 and turn it into ext3 and um, everything. So they use a tool here 
that is called Tune2FS, which is a very basic tool, and I have used it in many videos in the past to show you how to do things like set reserve space on drives to zero if you don't need it, or make it smaller, or something like that. That's mainly the reason I use it. These people, of course, are very smart and tell you to do backups before you would attempt to do this. And so essentially, it's just a few steps here. You would uh, boot the machine up off of a USB stick, for instance, uh, get access to the drive. I could mount it to the MNT there directory, the mount directory, and I could change this. Super simple. If you want to read this, you can go check it out, and then they, they have some more details here and things that you can do. So what should I do? Should I leave it EXT3? Or should I go to EXT4? By the way, one of the things that EXT4 added to Linux, and um, there's a there was a myth for a long time that you never had to defrag a hard drive if you were running Linux because the EXT3 system, EXT2 and EXT3, were so careful about their allocations that uh, they limited fragmentation. Um, that is true, but EXT4 gave us the, uh, what is it, the E4 defrag program, which actually does a defrag if a system needs it. The only time that you should ever have to defrag an EXT4 system is if you have a whole button of extremely huge files. And if you go through the process of doing that, then that might make the system run a little bit faster. But most of the time on a Linux system, uh, you're not going to see any problems. So let's just for the fun of it here, uh, before we wrap up, uh, let's see how fragmented our Linux system is here. Of course, we can only do the, uh, so the other one. So we will use E4D frag. Remember, this won't work on the first partition, is what I was trying to say. So we're going to look at the home directory in particular, because that's on that partition. And we're just going to have it do a test. Okay, let's see if it... I need to do this as root to make this work. sudo e4 defrag. And it should go very, very quickly, because this is doing this on an SSD. And it's telling me that the fragmentation score on this drive is absolute zero. Now, you probably should never, ever, ever have to defrag an SSD. And I don't even think the system will allow you to do it if you're sitting in front of it. But I have been able to get it to let me defrag an SSD through SSH. So I'm not going to actually turn it loose. And the way to do that would be just to remove the, the option there. So that's one of the features that came along with EXT4, which I will never use on this system because it has an SSD. Fragmentation doesn't mean that much with SSDs, right? That only applies to spinning drives where the heads move around. So if you have a fragmented file, the head has to move around and get all the little pieces if it's fragmented, right? I look forward to your comments and suggestions. Thank you for watching the video. We'll get another one up here soon.